So last lecture, I had to stop in the middle of my written notes because I wrote too much and the proofs were taking too long. So my current lecture notes are going to be a mix of what should have been lecture seven and, and lecture eight. So it's a little bit less organized than usual. Surprise, surprise, it is actually usually organized. So what did we do on Tuesday? Just a quick summary. We showed, I think it was Tuesday, we showed that separable dual spaces have the infinity Martin-Gale convergence property. Example is little L1, which is a separable dual space, but you know, not quite a, a nice space because it's L1, it's not reflexive. And we also show that reflexive spaces have the infinity Martin-Gale convergence property. Key example being general LP spaces for P greater than one less than infinity. And these don't necessarily have to be separable. For example, little L2 of R, R with the counting measure, not separable, but it is a Hilbert space and it does have the infinity Martin-Gale convergence property. That I think was the, the point of Tuesday from what I remember. So now we're going to move on to the, the radon nicotine property and, and vector measures, because you can't talk about the radon nicotine property without vector measures. And vector measure theory, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd call it a field in itself, but there is a, a really nice book on, called Vector Measures. There's enough material on vector measures for a book or a few books by Distel and Uhl. I think from the 70s, I think it's from 1976 or something. And vector measures are a topic that could be really dry. Like you wouldn't expect it to be a particularly fun thing to read or write about. But these guys managed to write an extremely readable book on vector measures and I commend them for that. It's very nicely written, actually enjoyable, very surprising. And I've taken a couple of things from that book, but for the most part, I'm still following Pizier's, Martin Gale's and Barnack spaces. But yeah, if you're interested in vector measure stuff, have a look at this book, it's quite good. You know where to find it online. I don't need to give you the illegal links. Okay. So what do I need to do? I need to define vector measures before I do anything else. Let's start here. Yep. So let's take a Barnack space and a measurable space. And given that, let's define what we mean by an X valued vector measure. An X valued vector measure is nothing but a function, which we call mu, try to draw a bold mu because it's vector valued. A function mu from the sigma algebra into the, the Banach space X. And the additional assumption that it needs is that it's countably additive. And I will define that. Countably additive. What that means is that for all sequences uh, what am I calling them, EN? So for all countable sequences, sequences are countable by definition, right? All countable sequences of pairwise disjoint sets in the sigma algebra A, of course, you have the, the, the measure, so the value of mu, the measure of the union has to be the sum of the measures. Right, this is a familiar property from measure theory. A measure, I mean, there are many, how many formal definitions of measure are there, right? A couple, but they're all sort of equivalent, right? A measure is a function on a sigma algebra which has this countable additivity property, but generally measures are also allowed to be infinite. You're allowed to have infinite measure sets. You should note here that because we're demanding the function is actually valued in X, you can't have infinite measure sets because infinity is not an element of the Barnack space. So I'm ruling out the possibility of infinite measure sets. And the reason for this is that there's no real nice notion of infinity in a Barnack space in general. If you take a real valued measure 
you have positive infinity and negative infinity, and these play nicely with the order structure of the real line. But if you take a general Banach space, and particularly an infinite dimensional one, you have lots of different directions in which you could approach infinity. So you don't have this nice notion of plus infinity or minus infinity. You could think of like the one point at infinity if you do like a one point compactification of the Banach space, or you could think of all these possible infinite directions, uh, infinite yeah, directions and then have an infinity in each direction. And this is confusing and we don't want to think about that. So we simply don't allow infinite measure. Hey, okay. Alex, yep. um, I have a quick question. Um, mm. So does the empty set get mapped to the zero vector? It's going to have to. It will follow from countable additivity. It follows from countable additivity, okay. All because right. you can in particular take EN to be the empty set for each N. Right, yes, you can. And <laughs> these sets are pairwise disjoint because their intersection is the empty set. Mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then you'll get that the measure of the empty set has to be the sum, an infinite sum of measures of the empty set. And the only vector that's going to satisfy that's the zero vector. <laughs> so all of the measure theoretic properties you're familiar with follow from this one assumption of countable additivity, actually. Nice. Yeah, that's a good question. So the first observation I made was that there's no infinite measures. The second observation is that part of this definition. There's a question that, in the chat. Yes. Yep, that's exactly what I'm going to say, Calvin. The sum is defined. That's part of the definition. So the sum is defined, and the sum is independent of the order of summation. Because in general, an infinite sum actually, well, the convergence of an infinite series depends or potentially depends on the order of summation, right? So this sum is usually defined as the limit as n goes to infinity of the partial sum from n equals zero up to capital N, right? And then you want convergence of this in X. But because this, uni this union here, this doesn't see the order that you put the sets in, doesn't see the order of the sequence. So you can reorder the sequence arbitrarily and get convergence of that series. So what this says is that this sum, oops, there's my first glitch of the day. This sum converges unconditionally. And we're gonna see unconditionality a bit more when we consider the UMD property, unconditionality of Martingale differences. But vector measures have some unconditionality built in basically. This sum is going to have to converge no matter what order you put it in. And that's yeah, implicitly part of the assumption. So there's, there's subtleties in this definition. It looks like a pretty sort of straightforward definition, but when your definition involves an infinite series, you already have something subtle going on. Um, any other questions about the definition? Heard something, so maybe somebody's just unmuted for a second there. I don't know. All good. All good. So that's what a vector measure is. Um, do I want to say anything about that? And yeah, let me just re emphasize in case anybody didn't quite catch the significance the measure of every set is a vector. Measures of sets are vectors. And try not to think too much about the interpretation of vectors as sizes. Just consider these as abstract things. And it's probably the easiest way to think about it. So as I said, measures, there's no infinite measures. So in particular, the measure of the full set has to be a, a vector in the space. It can't be infinity. So there's not really any sense of talking about finite measures. We're not going to distinguish finite measures from infinite ones. But because we're talking about measures that don't have signs, we're sort of talking about signed vector measures here. We have the notion of variation, which turns out to be important. So finite measures don't make sense, but measures of finite variation do. And these are important. So where's my definition here? Here it is. So given an X valued vector measure mu on the sum measurable space, the variation of the measure, 
So the variation of mu is a scalar valued measure, actually. So it's the following scalar valued measure. And by scalar valued measure, I just mean a measure in the classical sense. So the variation of a vector measure is the measure which we call absolute value in a sense, absolute value of mu, mapping the sigma algebra into the extended interval zero to positive infinity. Now it can be infinity. And this isn't the norm, <laughs> it's something different. It's a supremum over all pi. Pi is gonna be a partition. I'll define that in a second. Supremum over of these norms where the supremum is over all partitions pi of E naturally in the sigma algebra A. So you look at all the way of decomposing E into a disjoint union of measurable sets and you sum up the norm of the measure of each of those sets because the measure of each of those sets is a vector. You don't sum up the measures, you've got countable additivity over here. It's basically, if you take this, this expression in countable additivity here and you put a norm inside each of these summands and then you look at the maximal possible one over all decompositions, that's the variation. If you're familiar with measure theory, you see the variation of a measure, it's the same thing. But now there, were, there are norms inside the measure. Okay, we define what's called the total variation norm. of a vector measure. This is written so norm sub var, variation norm. And this is the variation of the full set S because we're looking at a vector measure on a, a measurable space S with the sigma algebra. And we say that mu has bounded variation or finite variation if this norm is finite. So what that means is you can look at all possible partitions of the whole space and you look at this sum of norms of measures over the partition and the supreme is finite. Uh, it's called variation because this says that in some geometric sense, the measure is not varying too much over the whole space. Um, Equivalently, so equivalent to bounded variation, equivalently, there exists a finite measure, so a finite scalar valued measure. When I say measure, I mean scalar valued measure, like classical measure. Bounded variation is equivalent to the existence of a finite measure uh, new on A such that you can control the norm of the measure of every set. This is a bold mu by the scalar measure new of the set. This is a, I think two line proof, something like that. The minimal such measure here, the minimal new that works is precisely the, the variation, the variation measure of the vector measure. And of course, being bounded variation just says that this measure is a finite measure. Okay. Last bit of notation in this definition. We write M S A valued in X to be the Banach space of all X valued vector measures on the measurable space SA with the total variation norm. And if you want, you can prove that that's a Barnack space. Proving something is a Barnack space is usually not very interesting and it's the same in this case, not a particularly interesting proof, so I won't do it. But you can trust me that this space is complete. Everybody okay with these definitions?
do we still have our convention that all measure spaces are sigma finite? And yep. if so, does this somehow carry over to a condition on vector valued measures? Um, well, there's no notion of finiteness anymore. So all measures, okay, when I say all measures are sigma finite, I'm going to keep the convention that measure means scalar valued measure. <laughs> No, but uh, could it me could that mean that uh, the total variation measure is suddenly not a measure anymore because it's not sigma finite? You got me there. <laughs> yeah, let's let's try to assume that the total variation norm is always sigma finite. <laughs> that's a good point. I'm not sure whether that's going to affect things in the future, but it could. So let's keep that in mind. But let's also keep in mind that everything will ultimately work. <laughs> Fair point. You got me there. Okay. Sometimes I'm going to do constructions in terms of measures, scalar valid measures, and we will always assume those are sigma finite. And then the vector measures we end up constructing will always also be sigma finite in that sense that their total variation, that their variation measure is sigma finite. I'll try to say sigma finite from now on wherever I can, and that'll that'll help us. You always know how to find the counter examples. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Yeah, it's a good point. I probably should have been more careful and really said sigma finite everywhere that I needed it. Just just add in sigma finite wherever we can. So is the problem with it not being sigma finite is that you didn't you can't necessarily define the variation of a of a set if you're not in the sigma. No, you can define the variation. The problem is that you might have a vector measure which is kind of bad and it's got like it's got a variation measure which is not sigma finite. Like this is not going to be a measure of bounded variation because bounded variation vector measures have finite variation measures, and in particular they have sigma finite variation measures because finite is much stronger than sigma finite. Yeah, I think we're not actually going to deal with any vector measures that don't have bounded variation. So we're not going to have to worry about that too much. But in theory, yeah, you have to think about that when you're extending this vector measure theory to its full extent. I'll try to be more careful from now on with sigma finiteness. So um, one thing you can do with a vector measure, which we're not really going to use, but which I have to point out, One can integrate uh, scalar valued functions. So you can integrate a scalar valued F against a vector measure mu. So you can define the integral over S of F of S d mu of s, where mu is the vector measure. And this will be in x, it'll be a vector. You can do that for all f, which is L1 with respect to the variation measure. And the way you define this is by taking simple f and extending by density. But we're not going to do that. The proof's in the notes, if you want to look at that. I don't think we use this construction anywhere, though. Just thought I'd point it out. So let me give an example, a class of examples of vector measures. Let's take X to be a Banach space. Let's say, okay, given X, given that measurable space and given a finite measure on this measurable space. Not a vector measure, a finite scalar measure. And also given a function f, vector valued function, which is L1 with respect to this finite measure valued in x. So f is in this Bachner space. We can define a vector measure. Um, we can call it mu, or it's more commonly called f nu. And it's defined 
kind of in, a, in an obvious way, the measure of a set A is defined to be the integral over A of the function F d nu. This is a Bochner integral. We're used to Bochner integrals now, but I'm gonna point it out anyway. And that's valued in X. You'd, you've seen this in measure theory before. You can integrate a function with respect to a measure that gives you another measure, right? Now this measure has bounded variation. And I'm gonna give you the computation. Given a partition of S, so if you have this disjoint union, then I can say that the, the total variation norm of the measure mu is less than or equal to the sum over this partition of the norm of the measures of the sets in the partition like that. Uh, how do I want to do this? We write out the definition. So this is the integral over Sn of f, let's say f of s d nu s. We just put the norm inside the integral quite naively. And we use that these sets Sn are all disjoint so that we're summing up integrals over disjoint sets. This is just an integral over the union. So that's the integral over S of the norm of F d nu. And this is the L1 norm of F, which we assumed was finite. F's in L1, right? So then when you take the supremum over all of these partitions, you find that the variation norm is less than or equal to the L1 norm of F. Actually, equality holds here. But you have to think a little bit more to prove that. I forget whether I wrote that in the notes or whether I call it an exercise, but we don't even need that fact. So when you integrate an L1 function against a finite measure, you get a vector measure of bounded variation. This is the simplest class of examples. And a lot of the time, this is the only example, it turns out. I have to also mention also if A has measure zero with respect to the, the scalar measure nu, then this new vector measure is the integral over A of F of S D nu S. And because A has got zero new measure, this is the zero vector. So what this tells you in the notation that I introduced on Tuesday is that the variation measure of mu, which is a scalar measure, is absolutely continuous with respect to nu. Because of course, if you look at all partitions of A, well, all the sets in this partition have to have measure zero as well, right? So you're gonna have a sum of norms of zero vectors when you check what the variation measure actually is on a set A of zero measure. Right. I will recall what that means, this absolute continuity, because I said it very quickly on Tuesday, people could have forgotten. If mu and nu are signed measures, so they're scalar valued, but they could have signs. You say that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Absolutely continuous with respect to mu, if mu of A equals zero implies nu of A equals zero. Just a reminder there. And I've told you on Tuesday, the scalar valued right on Nicodeme theorem. I'm not gonna state it again because I'm gonna give a vector valued right on Nicodeme property. And then I'm gonna say that the scalar field has the right on Nicodeme property. And that's gonna remind you of what the right on Nicodeme theorem was. 
Oh, we just reached the end of lecture seven, by the way. <laughs> Very good. Oh, no, we didn't have an extra page that fell off. Sorry. Let's make an important definition. Given a Barnard space X, given a sigma finite measure space. Yeah, I will say sigma finite here. So mu is the measure, which is sigma finite. We say that X has the radon nicotine property. Uh, which we call R and P. X has the Rudder nicotine property with respect to this space. If for any, not for every, I should say, for any sounds a bit bad, if for every X valued vector measure uh, new on the measurable space SA such that firstly, we make the assumption that nu's got bounded variation. And secondly, we make the assumption that the variation measure of nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So for every vector measure satisfying these assumptions, there exists a function F in L1, L1 of mu valued in X, such that the vector measure nu is actually the vector measure f mu that we defined before. Meaning that nu of a is the integral over a of f d mu for all measurable sets a. That's the radon nicotine property with respect to a given measure space. And we say more simply that X has the radon nicotine property, not with respect to anything, just the global radon nicotine property. If X has the radon nicotine property with respect to every sigma finite space, measure space, I should say. All right. And rather than stating the radon nicotine theorem, let's just say theorem every finite dimensional X has the radon nicotine property. In particular, the scalar field has the radon nicotine property. That's the radon nicotine theorem. All right, any issues with the definition? I've said sigma finite where I should, so that rules out any technicalities. Here you do usually assume sigma finite anyway. That's not just an artificial thing. Nothing in the chat, good. So, radon nicotine property, we're gonna spend a couple of lectures talking about that. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna say in words that, radon, well not in words, I'm gonna just state radon nicotine property is equivalent to the P-Martingale convergence property that I introduced for every P. As in, if you have this property for one P, that's equivalent to having radon nicotine property. And that's equivalent to having PMCP for all P. <laughs> but we haven't proven that yet. And that would be the end of lecture seven if we were still in lecture seven. Let's just say end of lecture seven. But this is lecture eight, so we have to keep going. Lecture eight, proper. Okay, first we recall what the radon nicotine property is, but we've just done that, so we don't need to make that recollection. <laughs> the goal of this lecture, which we might not get to because lecture eight is probably too long for the remainder of lecture eight. The goal of this lecture, which we might not get to, is that the radon nicotine property implies the one martingale convergence property. So this is just one direction of the equivalence I just stated above. And remember that the one Martingale convergence property is the strongest of the Martingale convergence properties. It will imply PMCP 
for all p greater than or equal to one. And this is good. I mean, we showed some examples where we showed that certain classes of spaces had the infinity Martingale convergence property, the weakest one. And we showed some examples of spaces that don't have that weakest one. And it follows these spaces aren't going to have the radon nicotine property. And eventually we're going to show that the infinity Martingale convergence property implies the radon nicotine property <laughs> and completing a loop here. But today's just going to be about the one Martingale convergence property. Now I have, I have the main part of this lecture, this lecture eight that we've only just started is a proposition that I figure might take 45 minutes. So we're gonna have to start the proof, have a break in the middle of the proof and then come back to the proof. And I don't know whether that's a good idea. Would people prefer to break a proof in the middle or have a, an artificial early break? So we have a, a short first half and a long second half. Any strong preferences either way? You can vote in chat. <laughs> I prefer an early break, if I may say. Uh, OK, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll write the, what the proposition is, and then we'll have the break, and then we'll do the proof. How about that? This seems reasonable. So we start with a proposition. And what this proposition is about, well, whenever, whenever you assume the radon nicotine property and you want to prove something else, your proof always takes the following form. Construct an appropriate vector measure, invoke the radon nicotine property to pull out a function and use that function to prove what you want to prove. So this proposition is about construction of certain vector measures. Right? Given the Banach space X and given probability space. And suppose F bullet is an L1 bounded uniformly integrable X valued martingale. Do I need to give any more information? Yes. With respect to some filtration. On the probability space, of course. This is gonna be used in proving the one Martingale convergence property. So this is the sort of thing we need to work with there. Given that, then there exists an X valued vector measure uh, mu on A with the following properties. Firstly, the measure of a set A for every A in the sigma algebra A n from the filtration. The measure of A is given by the integral over A of the nth element of the martingale. That's the first property. The second property is that the variation is finite. And in fact, the variation is bounded by the supremum over N of the L1 norm of Fn. This is the L1 norm of the martingale. And thirdly, the variation measure of mu is absolutely continuous with respect to the probability measure. And you can already start to imagine how we can use the radon nicotine property on such a measure to prove the one Martingale convergence property. This measure is going to induce a function. That function is going to be the almost everywhere limit of the Martingale using um, these properties. Uh, so are we allowed to say that just mu is absolutely continuous or do we say the, the variation of mu is Oh yeah, I guess you can use that as a definition of absolute continuity of a vector measure. Right. It's just yeah, you, wrote the, you, wrote, you wrote the other thing in the notes. So, uh, Did I? I just, yeah, don't bring that up. Yeah. That doesn't really matter, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I should probably fix that in the notes then. Or um, yeah. just make sure it's consistent in the notes at least. Because yeah, I'm sure. not sure it's consistent there. Yeah. Okay, so we will start the proof after the break because the proof's a little bit long and I really don't want to break it up in the middle. <laughs>